the 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 um, attempted theft um, is at which was was prevented is great, but uh, I'm afraid the actual theft uh, and the downtime on the pipeline is enormous. Uh, I think um, I would be interested to know how many days in the past um, year the pipeline was actually able to operate unabated and without interruption. Given that we are now going into the harvesting season and the huge diesel demand which will come into play um, in the inland regions, um, will we have a repeat of last year's shortage of diesel? Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Lees. Uh, yes, the, the attempts uh, at uh, theft of fuel has been uh, a, a problem. And as you say, it has been going on unabated. We have, uh, in the meantime, um, over the past uh, year, certainly implemented quite a number of measures, uh, which we are still in the process of implementing. We have also engaged quite, ex quite extensively with the, uh, the, the authorities, uh, SAPs, the uh, prosecuting authorities, because as much as we have made quite a number of arrests, we have also uh, not seen the successes come through the courts. So there's quite a bit of uh, engagement. Uh, we have in fact appointed a, an advocate to hold a watching brief over these matters. Mm -hmm. So as we sit, uh, we have a number of, um, uh, we have a number of people that are under arrest. Uh, uh, we have uh, actual theft incidents uh, this year, year to date, uh, approximately 134. We are sitting with uh, 38 uh, suspects in this year, up to 2021. We have, for last year, 84 suspects that have been arrested, so a total of 124. Um, and out of that, we have only thus far had one conviction. So, of course, a matter of concern for us. However, we have also been implementing a number of measures to um, assist us in avoiding an intrusion into the pipeline. So um, as we said, we are rolling out um, IoT devices on these block valves uh, that they have been trying to target. Uh, we, have, uh, we are lo uh, rolling out uh, security and situational management uh, systems. And we are also in engagement with the CSIR for a system that can in fact protect the pipeline as a whole. Now, some years ago, when the pipeline was in fact, uh, uh, when the thinking around the pipeline was in place and the construction has happen happened, for some other reason, the risk of fuel theft uh, was not identified as a major risk. And in fact, we have only been experiencing uh, the, the frequency of fuel theft incidents since last year. So we are currently uh, busy with quite a few uh, initiatives uh, where we are working on actually protecting the pipeline, one of which is the application that we have currently made for the actual pipeline to also be declared critical infrastructure, pretty much as a national key point, as our depots uh, and terminals are. Uh, this is currently not the case, and we are hoping that if we uh, have the actual uh, uh, pipeline declared as a national key point, then we would also be able to put uh, additional security measures. We have increased the security, we have increased the drone, uh, uh, um, we have increased the helicopter surveillance, and uh, we are in the process now of also going out to contract for other environmental remediation uh, contracts. You mentioned uh, on, the, on the release the matter of the, the sites that are open. Uh, it is unfortunate, uh, despite uh, a number of the efforts that we have put in place, we I have to also confirm that uh, we believe there is a case of internal collusion, and we do have uh, uh, some investigations at a very sensitive stage with the Hawks to try and identify not only the internal uh, uh, employees who may be involved in it, but also the syndicates and the kingpins involved in organizing uh, these uh, uh, attempts at our pipeline. So we do see that in the near future that we will see some, some successes, 
And uh, we do not believe that we will uh, be impacting negatively necessarily the diesel uh, supply. We are also working very closely with the farming uh, community um, and as well as our customers to, to ensure that we get the supply uh, to the inland um, and that we run the pipeline uh, uninterrupted. But as you say, yes, you are correct. We have had incidents, uh, it's happening pro probably on a weekly basis where we have incidents of some kind of tampering. Um, and uh, that takes the pipeline out for up to 24 hours uh, in a week. Um, and of course, putting a lot of pressure on, on the resources that we currently have available. But a number of measures that we are implementing, we believe that uh, we, we have seen a reduction this year and we believe that we will continue to see a reduction. Um, I'm not sure if I've answered. Uh, you, you have, you have indeed, Michelle. Thank you very much. My question was, um, ne next question was indeed about the internal participation in this, because um, how these thieves identify when the pipeline's carrying diesel and not um, flammable petrol is is beyond me, and it can only be uh, inside information being fed out as to what product actually is in the pipeline, um, because the breaches that I've seen, they actually cut a hole in the pipeline and weld a, a valve onto the, and then fill their tankers from that. Um, so yeah, I, I, you have answered. Um, you, Michelle, you may not be able to give me an answer now, but Mr. Chairman, what I'd like um, from, from Transnet Pipelines is a report on the remedial costs of these breaches. The, I mentioned two um, very close to home here. Um, the first one uh, bef th that occurred, I'm told, is going to cost Transnet 150 million rand to, to make good, not just in the repair to the pipeline and the losses in product and losses in revenue from the sales of product, simply the making good of the environment. Um, and, and to me, it sounds incredible because if that's the kind of cost on a weekly or twice a week basis that these breaches are taking place, um, it, it really requires some robust intervention from, from, from beyond Transnet's ability, perhaps even to military patrols. Um, to, to, to safeguard this pipeline. And I would support the move to have it declared a, a national key point or whatever the current terminology is for that, um, because it really has an enormous uh, impact on our economy for it to be done. Um, let me just get back to the investigation, Mr. Chairman. Um, the, the investigation that the SIU were, were looking at was a a contract of 150 million rand and, and a judgment was handed down in November last year. So that's um, a couple of months ago um, and assets of 18 million rand were forfeited to the state. So um, just, I just need some information about that, that particular contract. It was a contract of 150 million rand what was the basis for, for it being an invalid contract and how much of that 150 million rand had been paid out? Chairperson, if I may, um, as you will note, the reason why it was uh, determined irregular was as a consequence of the corrupt relationship between the relevant individual and the company. Uh, in other words, um, there was evidence of um, self-enrichment uh, in the securing of the, the contract. The extent to which uh, the, the contract, the obligated contract amount has been paid out, it's been paid out in full.
Is Alicia muted? Uh, Mr. Lee, Honorable Liz. Yeah, I'm sorry. Muted. I'm sorry. When I'm clicking, I'm muting and I'm talking. Um, you'll have to forgive right. me. Um, I, uh, I'm technically very savvy normally, so I'm not sure what's going on. Let me get ask my question again. My apologies. The contract was for 150 million rand, um, and and the, the the 18 million rand was has been forfeited to the state of the officials' assets. Um, but am I correct in assuming that the contract, had there been no undue relationship, um, would should have cost Transnet 132 million? Or what should it have cost? In a normal market relationship, what should that contract have cost? Now, what I'm trying to do is try and get a, a feel for whether the 18 million rand recovery is, is actually uh, in line with the market value of the contract. Chairperson, I would ask uh, my colleague Michelle to, to provide support. You will note that the SIU um, investigation did not report an undue enrichment uh, on the part of the contractor uh, at this point in time. So um, it would be difficult for me to, uh, to take a view on the, the fair value of the contract at this point in time. Thank you, Sandra. Is Michelle going to respond or should I move on? Yeah, I'm going to suggest that you move on. My understanding on this one is that the court, and I have to say Sandra would need to help me here, but that the court had um, indicated that it was the specifically the enrichment portion that needed to be recovered and nothing further than that. That was my understanding. Th thank you, Michelle. Um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's quite kind of incredible that on a 150 million rand contract, 18 million rand is enrichment. Um, and that, yo, yeah. this is just on one contract. No, no wonder the, the corruption levels in our country are so high if this is the level of enrichment that can take place on one contract. Um, okay, let's then move on to the, the, um, the big one, the 1064 locos. Um, that's on page 10. Right. So the, the original contract estimated cost of this of these 1064 locomotives was 38.6 billion. It then escalated to 54 billion, and then a further escalation took it to 55.4 billion Rand, a 43.5% increase um, in that in that cost to, to Transnet and ultimately. To, to the consumers and clients of Transnet. Um, the SIU has identified evidence to point, pointing towards maladministration. Um, what are the names of the people involved in that maladministration? Chairperson, um, the names of the people involved in the maladministration are those of former executives of the company. Um, uh, uh, by name, it would include uh, Minister, uh, Mr. Uh, Anosh Singh, Mr. Sia Bonga Gama, Mr. Brian Mulefe, uh, in, in, in the main. Um, it also includes Mr. Giuliani. Uh, in respect of all of these individuals, Transnet has instituted uh, civil claims uh, to recover um, uh, losses from those individuals as well. 
if I may, uh, whilst the matter is being discussed, also indicate that our review application seeks as a just and equitable settlement amongst others, the uh, recovery of uh, profits, excess, uh, excessive profits and kickbacks that have been demonstrated in our papers. Thank you, thank you, Sandra. Have you got any um, ballpark figure for the um, excessive the recoveries you're looking for? Uh, Honourable Lees, um, we are we're distinguishing between the kickback numbers, which um, are easily quantified with reference to the business development agreements entered into. And that's approximately twenty one percent on the relevant contracts. Um, with regard to the profits and excessive profits, we're going through a process of statement and rebatement with the OEMs uh, that will follow the filing of our papers to ensure that there's audited evidence that can support both our claim and uh, a representation by the OEMs with regard to, with regard to what reasonable costs would constitute. So the exact quantum of the uh, profit element has not yet been settled. Thank you, Sandra. So um, are the OEMs uh, cooperating in this? I mean, are these contracts still in place um, um, and, and the OEMs are still going to produce these locos? Uh, Honourable Lees, uh, the uh, two Chinese contracts, uh, you may recall, were suspended as a consequence of uh, the concerns regarding criminal uh, conduct, fraud and corruption. Uh, the other contracts, uh, General Electric delivered uh, in full. Bombardier is continuing to deliver. Uh, we've only commenced the process now of with the filing to start engaging the OEMs to come to a just and equitable settlement that will include the return of the profits. Okay, thanks, Sandra. So just, uh, I'm not sure whether you can answer, but um, so have any of these 1,064 locos been delivered and are operational or is it still in the process of manufacture somewhere in South Africa? I see the the manufacturing facilities were moved and that cost us another 1.5 billion rand. Uh, through you, Chairperson, Honourable Lees, um, yes, there's been delivery against the contract as I've indicated, Electric uh, uh, delivered all of the contracts under their contract. Uh, those uh, locomotives are, under, uh, are in operation. Bombardier Transportation has also delivered against the contract, uh, not completely. Those uh, locomotives are in operation. So has uh, China South Rail uh, delivered partially. Those locomotives are in operation. Uh, 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 China North Rail has um, performed in a very limited sense. Um, and most of those locomotives are defective. Uh, our, the remedy that we're seeking is that we retain what we've acquired minus the profits. Uh, so we, we retain it on a reasonable price basis. Um, and that which is defective and not remedied, that we do not retain those locomotives. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I, I would really like, if possible, um, the number of locos that have been delivered and are operational. Chairperson, um, if I may seek your indulgence just for a uh, few minutes, I will. I just want to go to my table so I can give you the exact amount Sandra. as it currently stands. Sandra, Ralph, um, yeah, I can assist if you want. You. Uh, can you assist, Ralph? Thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Ralph Mills. I uh, head up Transnet Energy Engineering. So uh, General Electric were contracted for 233 locomotives. They delivered 233. 
uh, China South Rail were contracted for 359 locomotives. They delivered 260 today. China North Rail, which is the 45Ds, they were contracted for 232 locomotives. They delivered 22. And uh, Bombardier Transport, which has now been bought out by Alstrom, they were uh, contracted for 240. And I think so far on the production line, I speak under correction, but it's around 68 that we've delivered uh, to date. It is in process. So the numbers vary. Thank you very much, Ralph. Um, so, Thanks. Mr. Chairman, the, the, by far the majority, I think, if my arithmetic, well, perhaps not by far, but certainly it seems that more than half these locos have been, have been delivered. And uh, Ralph, were they delivered on time or were there big delays? Uh, the Bombardier uh, contract continues to have delays. We had some problems in terms of local content. So that program has been delayed. The General Electric uh, contract ran very smoothly with all 233 being built in the Kudus Port facility in, in Pretoria. Uh, I speak under correction of the CSR, but it was going pretty well when, uh, when the contract was uh, suspended. Yeah. The CNR contract has not run well at all. The, the uh, uh, production line still has to be established correctly. The jigs uh, are, are not up to standard. So I don't, th it's, it's going to be a massive effort to get that program running. Thank you, Ralph. Mr. Chairman, so um, I, uh, the reason I'm, I'm asking for these is that earlier the, the 1064 contract was, was given to us as being part of the reason for um, Transnet not being able to operate at full steam, as it were, um, being a fan of steam locos myself. Um, but it seems that quite a large number of locos have been delivered, and it may well still be somewhat of a constraint, um, given that there are a number still outstanding. Um, but there's quite a large number out there on the rails operating, and I take it operating to, to spec. Um, yeah, so the last question on this one, Mr. Chairman Ralph, are, are you wanting to say something? Um, I, I was, well, let's hear your question first. And then no, no, I haven't I asked the question on. yet. Thank so, you. yeah, it's up to you. If you want to volunteer information, I'm very happy to accept it. But here we go. Um, the, the question about the, the um, sorry, the, the, this is a different topic altogether, my apologies. The role of the three transactional advisors um, in the in the procurement of these locos. Um, do we have details of the names of those three advisors, um, and where we stand with regard to to dealing with their malfeasance? Chairperson, uh, I can respond to that. Um, first of all, with regard to regiments, Transnet um, entered a settlement agreement to uh, recover fees in, in that regard. Um, we, uh, the, the uh, regiments, as you may be aware, uh, has been subject to litigation uh, and liquidation. Uh, at this point in time, um, our claim is still secure. Um, and um, however, the South African Revenue Services and one of the other creditors have uh, indicated that they will petition the, um, the application by uh, regiments to lift the, lit the liquidation. Uh, the, the motivation by regiments was that an unbundling of their group would uh, result in a higher return on the claims to, uh, to all of the concurrent claimants. Um, that, so that matter is still subjudicate. Uh, at this point in time, the order of court certainly provides for Transnet's claim to be honored. Um, with regard to McKinsey, um, our court papers uh, indicate the extent to which the um, 
1964 acquisition was uh, premised on the market demand strategy, uh, which uh, in respect of which McKinsey provided advice. At this point in time, we engaged in without prejudice discussions with McKinsey. Um, and with regard to the funding elements, we are also in uh, without prejudice discussions with uh, NetBank. Um, Sandra, what was the malfeasance on the part of NetBank? Uh, Chairperson, the, the uh, core of our concern and matter is a uh, conflict of interest uh, on the part of NetBank with regard to um, the NetBank swaps uh, arrangement that was entered into uh, days with an, after the, the club loan uh, was arranged and a, a floating rate was switched to a fixed rate. And that happened within days. So that's the core of our concern. Thank you, Sandra. Um, Mr. Chairman, there, there are a number of other investigations. Um, yeah, uh, but perhaps some of my colleagues uh, want to take those up, but um, let me say thank you to the team from Transnet. Um, I, I must say that by and large, I get a much warmer feeling about this team than I do with many other state-owned enterprises that appear before us. Um, and, and so thank you to Portia and your team. Um, and I may come in with another question, just nod if someone prompts me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, generally, I know you are very nice to first timers. I know, I know this comment, so um, yeah, um, but I think I'm always nice, Mr. Chairman. I think one can share that sentiment that you would like to raise. Oh, of course, of course. Um, any other issues, colleagues? All right. Mr. Issues Chairman. around expansions and people. Hello. Um, I, I have my hand up. Sorry, don't mean to be rude. Uh, Portia. No, no, no. Um, go right ahead, GC. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I just wanted, uh, the, I think Rolf was, um, uh, when the Honorable Lise was uh, about to ask his next question, so that we close off on the matter of um, the 1064 uh, properly. Uh, and I'll ask Ralph to sort of like uh, come in with addition, additional detail. So on the 1064, we basically have an under delivery effectively of 481 uh, locals that we actually need. And when they put in the 1064, the idea was to do a fleet renewal, also a reduction of the number of platforms um, that we'd be running as Transnet. At present, we have 194 staged locals. Now staged locals, it means that they park and they are waiting for parts. The 1064 uh, 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 case, was material in as far as uh, other than uh, GE in particular, the two Chinese uh, uh, rail um, uh, OEMs have not been very forthcoming coming in terms of supporting us with regard to space. So we've been working very hard to do to find workaround solutions to ensure that we are able to bring back to service the 194 uh, locals that, that are parked. And bearing in mind that we haven't been able to get this 481, it meant that we were using locals that we had actually planned to retire uh, from our operations. And so it's really your, what we are facing now is a much higher failure rate and also unscheduled uh, um, uh, maintenance that we have to undertake on, on, the, on the locals locals in particular. Ralph, I don't know if you've got anything uh, else to add, but I just wanted to make sure so that there isn't an impression created that um, the, the 1064 is an excuse on our side, but it really does have material 
uh, effects and impacts um, on us as an organization. I don't know, Ralph, do you want to add something and then we will step yeah. back and... and... Um, so I think just to add to what Portia said, uh, Jay, uh, we have brought back, uh, just checking the number, 678 locomotives from what is known as the B fleet. So the B, B fleet were originally run to stop. In other words, they weren't serviced towards the end of their life as a deliberate process. So now we've brought that uh, 678 of that fleet back to life. Uh, they average between about 30 to 40 years old. So it is a bit of a challenge in terms of uh, continued maintenance on them and their reliability. And just to add to what Porsche was saying, I'm just going to go up to check my numbers again. So today we have a total of uh, 477 locomotives in service from the Chinese fleet. Two of those, uh, it consists out of four different locomotives. Two of those locomotives were procured under the 1064 program, but two of the locomotives were procured prior to the 1064 program. As a result of the litigation, uh, the China Rail has now stopped engaging with us altogether in terms of, of maintenance and spares, which has made it a bit difficult. So we're trying all different avenues at the moment to look for alternative suppliers. And if necessary, is starting to look at re-engineering subsystems on the locomotives in the long term. I think that's about it, and this is uh, follow-on questions, perhaps. Thank you. Um, thanks for the clarity, Mr. Chairman. I am done. All right. No, it's fine. Um, Chairperson? and your team, uh, you will recall that um, the Fifth Parliament Scopa did pay a visit to Transnet uh, under far more difficult times and uh, an atmosphere which was riddled with tension at the time. Uh, and so it is good to see that uh, there is progress and some of the very difficult and critical areas which were on the radar of parliament at the time and will continue to be on our radar. I mean, as indicated, uh, because we've got so many things to do, because there's so much going wrong, uh, it probably is that's why it has taken so long for us to meet and interact. I would want to believe we are the only committee of parliament that which is telling government departments and interests by doing the right thing and achieving uh, our request to be jobless. Uh, the responses in my view have been satisfactory and competent uh, in the sense that uh, the team knows what it is that they're talking about and very forthright. It's rare, uh, but as I say, I can attribute it to that this is your first time visiting us uh, here. Of course, you are dealing with a qualification, um, particularly around four areas. And so we will continue monitoring that um, to see that progress is made. And of course, the reduction in your wasteful, irregular, and fruitless expenditure is something that uh, we want. I want to make uh, this point. You will hear us. We lost you, Chair. From time to time, uh, zooming in on the issue of urgent. Chairperson, we lost a lot of your comment. Uh, so we, uh, maybe you need to begin. Start so far, it's consequence management.
Sorry about that. My network decided to not comply. But let me make the final point I was making. Again, you will hear us repeatedly zooming in on the issue of urgency and speed insofar as consequence management is concerned and that dealing with corruption. And it is because we are racing against time. Because the elements of corruption and state capture are moving at a far greater pace, wanting to hide the wrongs that they did, probably some chow the money quicker than they would have wanted to, and movements of monies and assets which will make recoveries very, very difficult. And we commend the work that the SIU is doing uh, in dealing with these matters. But that hard work requires state entities to play ball in that they must move with an equal pace of urgency toe to toe with the elements of corruption. And so this is precisely the reason why we had issue with PROSA last week, telling us that they'll be moving slowly with, on some matters. And that's why members are repeatedly raising it today uh, to say speed and urgency. We are in desperate times chasing a moving target and chasing time. And so I hope there will be a renewed appreciation on the part of Transnet about this urgency. Uh, and that is why I was very quick to uh, interject on the issue of executives being new. Um, our expectation is that the newness is not a qualification or of any sort. Newness means hit the ground running. And um, so I think that uh, colleagues, we, we, we remain uh, somewhat at ease or our anxieties in so far as transnet are concerned have somewhat been allayed this morning. Uh, and we will continue monitoring the work that is being done. Obviously, uh, this does not mean we are home and dry and there will be new issues to surface and we will equally have to deal uh, with those as well. Uh, they are historic matters, which I'm pretty certain will surface uh, and will have to be dealt with. But there's laying a foundation today of um, us interacting with uh, Transnet. I think that um, the leadership and management have uh, demonstrated to us uh, a level of cooperation which inspires confidence and very rare do we see it in SOEs. I suppose it's because generally our reputation precedes us that we don't take nonsense. Um, and so people come here very aggro and all sorts of other things. And then it just, it's very sad uh, that they do that because all we want to do is do our job, exercise oversight and hold people accountable. Um, and that's precisely what it is that we'll do. But I think Transnet can uh, leave today. We will be interacting and dealing with the issues of deviations and expansions at a later date. And we'll interrogate those further. Um, and we'll await the outcomes of the investigations. Um, and then we'll keep track of how you are responding to the audit outcomes, your audit action plan, amongst others, to make sure that you ultimately arrive at a point of a clean audit. Um, and we expect nothing less. Um, and so that is where we are wanting you to gear to at the same time, ensure that you fulfill your issues in so far as your responsibilities are and your mandate. Um, I do want to, again, amplify the issue that uh, came to the uh, to the fore is uh, called out by the chairperson of the board uh, to say that um, I doubt the comment by Honorable Lise was uh, passing a judgment uh, on um, to Mamum Zimela, uh, but to do place it on record so that Transnet is aware uh, that we will be at some point um, uh, 
when we do the work expecting her to be appearing before us on those historic matters of where she was, and we'll be expecting the cooperation of Transnet in that regard to ensure that um, she's here. Ultimately, it's one public purse, it's one state. And so we would want uh, to hold people accountable and to have people provide answers for work that they've done for the state wherever they may have been deployed or stationed uh, at, at any time. Um, so I hope that uh, that clarifies that matter. It was not a positive judgment, uh, but it nonetheless is a matter on our radar. Because to be frank, uh, Chairperson, we remain ultimately and fundamentally concerned about the heightened rate of the movement of people between government departments. Um, and so that is a matter on our radar, but I'm sure at an appropriate time, as we had announced before, uh, and reiterating today that um, that matter will be on our radar. Colleagues, let me take this opportunity to thank the chairperson of the board and board members and the executives of Transnet um, for their appearance this morning. Morning and the responses that they have provided. Um, I want to say we will request uh, that those reach us by uh, next week, Tuesday, close of business. Uh, so one week, where if there were any matters, members will indicate to us, and Mr. Chair and CEO, we will indicate to you if there are any matters substantively that require written responses as we do our report on this meeting. Uh, which I think Um, so you want to make a comment and then I'll go. Mr. Chairman, we right, asked you over to you if there's any concluding remarks on your Mr. Chairperson. <clears throat> oh, I'm not sure. Oh, which party there? But I mean, all right. Uh, uh, Mr. List, did you hear the part where I was clarifying on the issues of the, the matter that was raised by the chain so far as Mom Zamela is concerned? I, I did indeed, Mr. Chairman, and you're okay. quite right. Um, okay. We lost you that for was my concluding time. remark. All right. No, that's fine. I was seeing your hand, and then if you have got no other issue, the chairperson of the board may have an opportunity to make concluding remarks. From our side, Mr. Chairman and the executives, the board, thank you very much. And to the ministry as well and SIU, AG and uh, National Treasury, um, we will be in touch. And where there are required written responses, if those may reach us by next week, Tuesday, close of business, uh, we will give you one week. Members will indicate to us if there's any matter specific that requires a written response and we will transmit it to Transnet uh, timelessly. Right. Mr. Lees, are you fine? Absolutely, Mr. Chairman. A big thank All right, you. To so I'll see your hand. All right, I'll see your hand. Mr. Chairperson, you over to you. Uh, Modula Stola. Oh, Gallebo uh, Handard. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, uh, for your humbling compliments. Uh, we also appreciate the robustness of uh, SCOPA members in dealing with the issues that are facing Transnet. Uh, we recommit really to cooperating with SCOPA because in the final analysis, I think it's uh, this robustness that will make Transnet the kind of an entity uh, that it was envisaged to be to discharge its mandate to the benefit of South Africans. Uh, and we, we go back therefore to reflect on the questions that have been raised and management uh, will respond uh, adequately to those questions. It's not an easy thing uh, to deal with these questions, but we would we want to assure you, Chairperson, that 
we've got no interest in trying to cover up anything. Uh, uh, we like people who are tough on us and we've got management of absolute professionals uh, who are transparent in how they do things and uh, we shall continue to manifest that transparency in our relationship with the uh, SCOPA. Portia, I thought that at some point, uh, maybe uh, SCOPA might want to give us the opportunity, Chairperson, to, to reflect on the vision of uh, the new Transnet and the strategy to attain that, uh, that vision, how we, we are transforming Transnet and the economy. Uh, of course, you'll see elements of that in our corporate plan, but maybe at some point you might want to invite Transnet to share um, its perspectives with you and ask questions to the extent necessary. I'd like to thank you, Chairperson, and the honorable members for the opportunity again to share this day with you. Um, I appreciate the fact that uh, you have uh, uh, appreciated uh, our efforts to, to meet uh, your requirements, inadequate as it might be. Thank you very much, Shepard. Um, no, no problem, Shepard. Rest assured, we will be paying you a visit uh, once uh, there is a semblance of normality in the country as we all try and grapple with the realities of COVID-19. Uh, we are just still trying to deal with the mischief and malfeasance that has characterized PPE procurement in the COVID-19 realities. Um, and so we will be revisiting you. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, we will then have an opportunity to interact with uh, the new vision and the corporate plan. Uh, for your committee where ordinarily your matters uh, reside. Well, we just, uh, 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 the last line of defense in so far as the parliamentary process is concerned, but I think for um, heightened oversight and informed oversight, it will be beneficial for us to interact with that uh, moving forward. So yes, we will be in touch. So thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, tonight we are dealing with NSFAS. And the National Skills Fund, the National Skills Fund is not to uh, table their annual report, so they will give us an explanation as to why not, and then we'll get into the NSFAS matters. And then tomorrow we have got NL, and then we will call it a week, uh, having uh, done that. And then all the other ESCOM related matters will probably have to have a special meeting. We'll make an application to the presiding officers because we may meet at a time when uh, the House requires us or when there are other parliamentary priorities which we expect it to be at. So we are working on that. So colleagues, let me thank you for this morning and uh, see you all sound and fresh at half past six tonight uh, for our graveyard session. So having said that, thank you very much and the meeting stands adjourned. Thank you very much, yeah. honorable members. Thank you, Chair. Siapa nak suspi? Thank you, Chef.